Union is strength, working together is strength. This is a, a Lego model that my six-year-old son Amos bought me for Christmas this year. And I opened it on Christmas Day and then when they were all in bed I thought, oh, I'll make this. And as I unwrapped the box and began to unwrap the cellophane, you know that stuff you can never quite break apart and then it splits all the way down the bag. I thought, why am I doing this on my own? I should wait till Amos wakes up tomorrow morning. We can do it together over breakfast. And that's what we did. And actually, um, making it with Amos over breakfast was far quicker because he knows far more in-depthly than I do as a six-year-old boy. And it was also more fun. So much more fun. In the book of Exodus, we meet Moses, the leader of the um, Israelite people who took them out of slavery in Egypt and into the desert for 40 years where, years where they wandered while they tried to work out who they were and where they fitted with God's purposes. And Moses is not working with others. Um, union, working together, is not his strength. We pick it up um, here in um, chapter 18 where it says, The next day Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people and they stood round him from morning till evening. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand round for you from morning till evening? Moses answered him, because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, replied, What you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice. And may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions, and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. But select capable men, and I believe if it was nowadays he'd say women as well, from all the people, men and women who fear God, trustworthy men and women who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties and tens. Let them serve as judges for the people at all times and let them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases, they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties and tens. They served as judges for the people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple ones they decided themselves. Then Moses sent his father-in-law on his way, and Jethro returned to his own country. Um, Jethro is fairly straight down the line with Moses, isn't he, in this passage? He says, what you're doing is not good. It's not like, that's just my opinion, or take it how you like it. He says, it's not good, and the work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me. Um, it's interesting, I think, that if you read the earlier part of this passage, Jethro comes to see Moses with Jethro's wife, wife Zipporah, and their two sons. Je uh, Moses' wife, Zipporah, and their two sons have been living with her dad, Moses' father-in-law, I think that could be because Moses is so busy, so consumed with the work, that y you deal with them. And let's be honest, some of us here, women and men, it could be as if our family were living with our father-in-law, actually. They may not physically be living there, but we are so busy, so consumed, that we wouldn't know from one end of the day to the next if they were actually in the house or not. Or maybe that's just me in some of the times in my life as I look back on it and you can't relate to that at all. Jethro speaks straightly to him. Um, I read a book by um, a lady called Strengthening the Spirit, um, Soul of Your Spirit and in it she wrote a chapter about living within your limits. And in that chapter she said, you will know if you're not living within your human limits, the limits that God places on you, if um, any of these things are apparent in your life. And you're going to see them on the next slide now. Um, she says, you're not living in your limits if you have irritability and hypersensitivity. 
So I was down at Tunbridge Angels ladies game today, just watching for a few minutes. Um, they were winning one nil. I thought, I've done my bit, I'll go now. And as I was walking out, one of the guys on the gate, who I know and talk to every week, said, yeah, you need to get back to the church, don't you? Because you only work one day a week. Um, I hear that, if I had a pound for every time I'd heard that, I'd have about 150 quid, I reckon. Uh, and on that, I just laughed it off. Now, if I am feeling the human limits and I hear that phrase, it gets under my skin. So those things that actually we take in our stride, if we are too stretched, then we're hypersensitive to them. Another thing she says is restlessness, that you just can't relax. Ever been like that? You sit down, you put the TV on, you flick through, you're not really watching it, and then you're checking your phone, and then you get up and you go out to a room, and you don't know why you went out there. And then you come back in and you ask someone, why did I go out there? And they say, well, I don't know, because I don't know why you went out there and why are you coming in? And now I'm not watching the programme that you were meant to be watching with me, but you won't. So there can just be this kind of hovering of, I'm not really settled, down to a real deep despair of knowing quite clearly that we are not comfortable with life. Um, Compulsive overworking. One American writer says that overworking is the cocaine of the last decade. People pride themselves on it. How are you? Oh, I am overworked. Oh, well done. It's almost in the evangelical Christian world a badge of honour that they, you must be exhausted if you're doing things for God. First 15 years of my um, life as a minister, I felt quite guilty when people said, oh, how are you doing? You must be really busy. It always was followed up with that. And I think, well, no, I'm not. I I mean, I'm I'm doing what I'm meant to be doing, and and it's full, but I'm not feeling completely overstretched. Because if you think, oh, no, if I admit that I'm not overstretched, and I'm not exhausted, and I'm not near breakdown, what about all the other people that are? Friends, we should be modelling a life to the world around us that says we want to be balanced. And I know as I say those phrases that I'm really irritating some of you because you say, but Neil, you don't understand my life. You're just a waffly vicar who wanders around with Bible commentaries. I live in the real world and I've got a horrible boss. Your boss is God and what I've read from him in the Bible is that actually he's on your side. (coughs) Can I just gently challenge you to just maybe shift one degree Make one change. Maybe it's turning off your emails at 9pm. And then turning them on in the morning after breakfast. Another challenge to us living within our limits is emotional numbness. That Actually, we're so overstretched that we can't experience the highs and the lows of life. Because that's just exhausting to put that emotional energy in. And I know when I've been in periods like that, it's when I've been involved in a baptismal service and people come up to me afterwards and they say, Neil, that was brilliant! That was so powerful, I could sense the presence of God. And I think, my trousers are wet. That's all I'm feeling right now. And for me, it's a really clear indicator of, Neil, you are not living within your human limits. You're stretched because you cannot enjoy this moment when somebody is saying, Jesus is the centre of my life. Um, Escapist behaviours, watching rubbish TV all the time, looking on the internet at really horrible stuff but also really pointless stuff like um, Russian road traffic accidents or something bland like that, just wasting your life away on things that don't matter. Eating um, food, just overeating, overeating, spending, just buying stuff that you don't need. I've got a friend and he said, my wife, ex-wife now, has got loads of clothes in the closet that have just not even been unpacked. Because when she feels low, blue water. Buy stuff. And the thing is, when we do the escapist behaviours, all the filling stuff, the great novels, the brilliant films, the the, the food that is healthy and nourishing and pleasure to um, actually create, reading the Bible, praying, music, all of those great things, we don't do them because we're doing these. And are you like me that that makes it even worse? Because you think, well, I've been doing this, and it's a complete waste of time, and it brings nothing to me, and because I've done that, all these creative things that I know bring me life and connect me with God and connect with, hu- with humanity, I've not done them. And it's a double whammy. 
We can feel disconnected from our identity and call. It's that thing that you knew God had called you to do, whether it was at church or the job you do. Do you remember when you had that moment, maybe as a teacher, and you saw a five-year-old stumble across the playground, fearful, into your classroom, and by the end of the day, they went out four and a half feet tall because they coped. And you thought, that's why I'm in it. That's why I do it. Whether it's architecture, working at Waitrose, preaching, helping people in the NHS, working in the media, whatever it is that you do, for most of us it's something that we've chosen to do because we think I'm good at it and I think God will be in it with me. When we are not living within our limits, we're just doing it. Another thing to mark, another building to draw, another interview for Radio Kent to do, another, another, another. Because we're just so stretched. Another one is not able to attend to human needs. Now I confess I only shower about once a week. I don't see the need for it. I do it once a week. It's a joy then because you really scrape off the dirt. (laughs) All of you that do it every day, you don't feel the benefit of it. But when we're not living within our limits, we're just bunging microwave meals down. We're not tidying the house. And I'm not talking about a wimpy show home. I'm talking about where you walk in a room and think, I don't know where I would start there to make it tidy. To the point where you think, we can't have people over for a coffee or a meal because where would we start in this place? We need DIY SOS, not to build something, just to remove stuff. And when we're not living within our limits, all of that stuff goes subtly to begin with, doesn't it? But it gradually builds up. Also, we end up hoarding energy. We think, I am so near the edge of falling apart that if I invest emotionally in you, I will fall apart. So I'm going to keep back. You'll see this for yourself when you come into church and you think, I just don't want to talk to anyone this week. I have not got the energy and I'm not talking about if you're somebody who is quieter and you know that meet and greet bit in the service that's the worst bit for you in the whole hour and a half I'm talking about when you know and you're aware actually I'm just not coping and so we just think I'm going to keep that energy so that I can keep going and finally she talks about a slippage in our spiritual practices what is it that you do that connects you with God my wife Jo loves playing the piano. She plays worship songs interspersed with Chopin, I think it is, and other music. And I can hear in there, and she's singing, and then she's playing classical bits. And I know that that is a moment for her that I should not interrupt because she's connecting with God. In the busyness, those things flutter out the window. So that Bible reading you do, that prayer walking, that art that you do, whatever it is that connects you with God. That just slips away because I haven't got the energy for it. I'm not asking you to put your hand up, but does any of this ring any bells with you? And from your faces, I can see yes. We looked at this as a staff team. I've got the whole chapter. If you would like um, it, I can email it to you. Um, and I said to us, do I recognise myself in any of these points? And it was a helpful but also an uncomfortable staff worship session. Because I think probably all of us could say, actually, I do recognise a lot of that in me. So what are you going to do about it if this is you? Talk. Talk with someone you trust. Talk with God and say, I'm not living within the human limits that you have placed on me, God. Talk to one of your friends and say, how can I um, get around this? Maybe for you it's training. Maybe saying, actually, I'm not very good at my job or at the thing I do in church. And so it takes me loads of time and causes me extra stress. And what I need is actually just to get trained up so that it becomes more of a pleasure than a challenge. Maybe it's trade. Maybe it's thinking, you know, I've been um, the captain of the girls' brigade since it was created. Um, Not picking on you, Joe, although you are the captain of the girls' brigade and you have been the captain since it was created. (laughs) Um, But apart from, this is just between us, none of them are listening. Do I need to trade and do something else? 
Because there's always a guilt, isn't there, in church? I'm thinking now of the things that we do in church. Or maybe it's your job that you're doing. Uh, maybe when you say, actually, I'm going to stop doing that and do that. We always think, no, I can't stop doing that because I'm indispensable. But there's plenty of indispensable people in the graveyard over there. And they're all dead and the world has carried on. So maybe, actually, I think I'm going to stop that and I'm going to do this instead. Maybe it's to teach someone else. So actually, I'm going to teach that person so that they get really good at that role so that I can step back from it. Or maybe it's take a break. I just need a few months off. At my last church, I had a deacon. Her world fell apart. She said, what am I going to do? I said, you need to take three to six months off from being a deacon. But what will the church think? Well, we won't tell them. Why do they need to know? You take the time off. I'll let the deacons know. And you don't have to come back at the end if you don't want to. She took the six months off. She came back. She was fully involved again. And for some of us, we just need a... <gasps> More and more business companies are giving people sabbaticals, a period of time off, because they realise that it's healthy for somebody to actually take a break. So lots of us may be challenged when it comes to living within our limits. And that's why in a church family, we need everyone to be involved, if possible. Because I have met friends, too many adults older than me, who would say, I spent too much time at the church and not enough time with my family. And I spend too much time with children who say, it felt like my parents loved the church more than they loved me. Now, I know they didn't, but that's what it felt like. Wouldn't it be great if we were all doing one or two things rather than a few people doing lots and lots of things? Here's a few reasons why you shouldn't get involved, why you should not help with things at TBC. The first one is guilt. I've seen too many people who are Christians, which means they're nice, saying, well, I'll do it. I'll do it because no one else is going to do it and it's got to be done. Oh, thanks for helping with Sunday school. Do you like children? I hate them. <laughs> I've never liked them. They smell. They don't put together coherent sentences. I'd rather work with slugs. Okay, okay, thanks though. It's just dumb, if I can be so blunt. So don't listen to what I've said tonight or walk around afterwards and think, oh, I better do something because you feel guilty. Only do it if you feel God is prompting you to. Another reason to not do it is because you're not gifted at it. You know, I could come up the front here, when we all go around, you can come up and be involved in the worship band if you want, and you can go to the sound and the streaming and the projection. I said to two of our teenage girls this morning, I said, why don't you go up the front and be really serious and say to them, can we lead worship? We think that we're really good at it, God's gifted us in it, and then sing really badly and see how Jules reacts. <laughs> really test her Christian faith and her generosity. You know, like on the X Factor, you know, don't you? Well, yeah, my name's Jeff. I work um, in accounting, and Brian told me I'm a brilliant singer, and that's why I'm here tonight. And then they open their mouth, and you're like, please, Lord, make it stop. If you're not gifted at it, don't do it. If you think you might be gifted at it, then give it a go. But take it on the chin when you realise you're not. Um, not being involved also because God is using you elsewhere. Maybe God is using you in the world, out there, and for you to be involved at TBC would actually constrict the work you do out there. Too many people have been guilted into giving up kingdom activity out there just to keep something running in a church. So for some of us it will be, no, actually, what I do out there is really key to God's kingdom activity. So I can't be involved in the things here. Here's some reasons to be involved. Um, to lighten the load for others. We need volunteers across the board, my friends. People give a lot of time, and maybe you could give a little bit every week, every fortnight, every month, that would just help us all breathe a little lighter. Reasons to be involved, because you've got the gifting. Please don't think, oh, I've got the gifting, but I'm not good enough as a Christian. Please read the Bible and see the bunch of a mess of people that God used to bring about his kingdom purposes. 
He used all kinds of broken and busted people like me and like you. And if he can use them, then he can use you and he can use me. So if he's given you the gifts, please feel free to roll up your sleeves and get involved. You do not need to be the finished product. A deacon at my last church, the first prayer he ever prayed when I was there, he said, God, we're all works in progress. And I clicked onto that and thought, I'm going to keep that. I am a work in progress. And finally, be involved because you'll grow in your faith. My personal experience is this. When we roll up our sleeves for God's kingdom, it's hard. It's frustrating. People can annoy us. We can annoy other people. But we grow in our faith. Is your faith beige? Is your faith stale? Could it be? Could it be? It's because you're not doing anything for God's kingdom. Might not be, but it might be. Reasons to be involved. There's a lady called Sarah Miles, and she um, wrote a book called Take This Bread, um, a memoir of her life. And she was raised as an atheist, and she lived an enthusiastically secular life as a restaurant cook and writer. Then one morning, for no earthly reason, she wandered into a church. She ate a piece of bread, took a sip of wine, and found herself radically transformed, embracing a faith she'd scorned and which would lead to feeding others in a way that she'd never imagined. Sarah started a food pantry, giving away literally tons of food from around the same altar where she'd first received the body of Christ, and providing hundreds of hungry families with free groceries each week. She did this in a church that was in a deprived area of her city, but the church was full of white, middle-class, artistic Christians who enjoyed embracing the arts. And she said, this is all good, but look at where we live. We've got to do something for these people who are unemployed, these children who have no education or poor education or can't get into school. Well, well, what do you think we should do? Let's start a food pantry. There's loads of food going to waste around here. And so they gathered it in. And these white, middle-class, artistic Christians said, we're help. And then she said, well, why don't we not just do a food pantry? Why don't we cook a meal for these people as well? And so every day they began to cook a meal for these people. And they would queue up, smelling the food, coming in, getting it and eating. And then she thought, well, all these volunteers who are helping me, um, some of them are the people that were out there now and they're coming in. Why don't we eat a meal beforehand together before we feed the people that are going to come in? Why don't we share communion together? I know some of them aren't Christians, but maybe as they break the bread and they drink the wine, they, like me, will experience the love and the presence and the power of God. Other churches in the city said, "Um, can you come and talk to us about what you're doing? Well, I've got no qualifications. just got passion in my heart. We'd like you to come and talk to us. And so it spread out through other churches in this city until the churches in that city began to feed those that needed it in so many ways. Could she have done that? Could she have written that book on her own after her dramatic transformation and coming to faith? No. She needed white, middle-class, artistic Christians. And she needed people that were unemployed and homeless who came in and helped as well to make that thing breathe. And friends, we need each other. And Moses needed a straight talking to from Jethro. Get other people to help you. I love it, in the beginning of the passage, which we didn't read, Moses' wife, his children don't live with him. At the end, Moses sends Jethro home, but his family stay with him. He seems to have got a bit of a balance back, accepting that he's got to live within his limits. And the way he does that is by saying to others, will you join me? Can you help out? And that's what tonight's about, really. It's saying, please go around and have a look. Have a look so that you find out the things that go on here. This morning, Daphne Duke, who has been in the church since it was started 150 years ago, she was in the teenager group then, although teenagers didn't technically exist then. She came up to me and she said, Neil? And I said, yes. She said, there's so many things that go on in this church that I don't know about. And I said, Daphne, if you don't know about them... Think of all the other people that won't know about them. (coughs) Have a look round. And off the back of that, please pray. Please pray. Prayer is key. 
had a message from someone who was here over the Christmas period, used to come to this church, and she said to me, Neil, I love it that TBC is a church that prays. She said, that's the one thing I got from my fortnight back here, that this place is saturated in prayer. Keep it going, because the church I'm at, we don't. So please take it and pray on your own, in your groups, wherever it is. And then maybe you'll get involved. No pressure, no guilt. But if God nudges you, go the way he nudges. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for what you've done through this church over 150 years. And we're in this chapter. And we thank you for the ways that you use us. And we'd ask you to increase it. So that we can look back in a few years' time and say, wow, we thought God was huge. But look how impressive he really is. We want to live within our limits. We want to roll up our sleeves for your kingdom in our places of work, in our homes, and in this church so that you get every single bit of the glory. In your name we pray. Amen.